well, how, how I'm going to approach this, because <laughs> I'm a bit faltering in, in my voice, is I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say a great deal around each slide, okay. Um, I think most of them are fairly self-explanatory, so hopefully, um, Hopefully we can we can sort of spend more time, and my colleagues can chip in as well in in, in discussions afterwards. But we'll see see how we go. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> right. So. Okay. So here's this is what we came up with. This the contribution to change. It's a it's a nice neat little little package, and I'm pleased that it, it sort of it didn't end up academic length book, but it's slightly longer than a than a sort of a paper or an essay. I think we've got we've come up with something that's that's. It's tried to be economical um, in terms of what we provide, and also there's an enormous amount of detail we could have gone into around the, meth the methods. What we've tried to do again is is give some kind of indication of uh, around the different, particular the data collection methods, but then give plenty of references for people to refer to for issues such as sampling, um, for good field practice, ethics, all those sorts of things. So we say we tried to say something about it, kind of set it up, but. Um, we didn't want to cram the guide full of that sort of detail. So it's quite useful just to just to kind of set out right now what we see as the guide is primarily designed for. Um, our initial brief was to look at rapid onset hazards, which is what we've done. And that's how we've, that's the thought process that structured what we've produced. However, there is a potential for it to be adapted, and again, that's I think that's something we can we can discuss. Um, certainly, in terms of slow onset natural hazards, I think personally it'd be difficult to to do this in a more uh, in more complex emergencies and more conflict type situations. Um, so, anyway, it's essentially designed for rapid onset hazards. The idea is to look primarily at recovery, so it's in the in the phase following immediate relief. Um, up to a kind of a medium term recovery. Difficult to go beyond that because of issues of, of recall, but again, there is flexibility built into this whereby it can be adapted for, for other situations. As we've said, we're attempting to look at contribution and contribution to change and not focus on attribution. And <coughs> the way it's set up, again, is primarily to work with communities that have actually returned or never were displaced from from where they live, because what we're trying to we're trying to understand the change in people's lives effectively in situ. Okay. <coughs> so the approach then, okay, contribution to change obviously has been used in various other other sectors and other spheres. In this particular context, we're looking at contribution to change as the relative importance of post-disaster interventions in aiding people's recovery. And in a very sort of simplistic sense, you have this, this diagram, which is, is basically making the point that, of course, interventions are only part of the story in terms of the recovery process. Um, we have, of course, the actions by the affected people and the communities themselves, often uh, undervalued, often underrepresented in, in discussions, but of course, as I'm sure all of you know, absolutely crucial. Um, and then, of course, not forgetting the fact that all this, you know, the, the activities both by external actors and by, as it were, the internally affected have to be set in the context of a number of various other factors and pressures and stresses and so on that shape the outcomes of the recovery process. So what we're trying to do is look at that red line, how that influences the recovery process, but in the context of everything else. And that's, we argue, is the only way that you can really establish what contribution to change means. So if we focus on that green, that lower part, you see, um, there is another complication. And this is something, again, that the more we thought this through, the more we realised this is well, how we have to look at this. We have to go beyond looking at the, what's been achieved. We also have to, have to set what's been achieved in the context of what needs to be done. Um, almost the sort of progress towards recovery. So you have this, you have, okay, we can look at the level of recovery which achieved and we can assess the sort of contribution of interventions to that as a portion of that achievement. But if we really want to understand contribution to change, we need to be able to effectively calibrate um, what's been achieved by what actually needs to be achieved in order to enable people to recover 
So uh, we have to look at it also in relation to the level of recovery required. I know the, all these terms one could challenge in, in certain ways, and that's fair enough, and we can, we can talk about that. Um, one of the issues, of course, is around do we simply, do we sim is, is our ambition simply for people to recover the state of the livelihoods that, were, that existed before the disaster, including being in a, arguably in a, in a vulnerable state? Um, so that's, that's recognized, and, that, and how we actually, that then has to be interpreted in terms of how we actually phrase what we mean by recovery. But as a, as a way of trying to get across the concept, we need, to, we need to gauge what's been achieved and the contribution to what's been achieved in terms of what actually needs to be done. So that's some of the underlying ideas. Um, as John has pointed out, it's very much shaped by the idea of, of trying to trying to understand change from the perspective of people, not from the perspective of, of any agency or external organisation that has particular objectives, but from people's own livelihood needs. We, we also think that in order to, to do this in a meaningful way, you can't, you have to look multidimensionally at the, all the various aspects of people's livelihoods and assets. You have to see recovery here in the context of all of those, even if your focus is perhaps on one particular sector, because it's in practice and in the reality of people's lives, things don't divide up so neatly into sectors. We, we decided on the household level as the level that could probably capture most of these types of changes, fully recognising there are, there are critical differences and issues that take place at the intra-household level, at, at a level that doesn't, uh, in, in terms of social dimensions, but also in terms of communities as well. There are certain, certain aspects which one might look more at in terms of a community level, say in terms of community infrastructure and services. <coughs> I am speaking too much, I can feel it going. Um, okay, now this is, and this is, the, the time frame is, again, so all, all these were all aspects that we had to sort of think through quite carefully. And our thinking process was very much through the course of doing the field work. Um, ideally, we'd have sat down and come up with all these ideas and tested them. Um, and perhaps, you know, ha in hindsight, that might have been a better way of doing it. But what we what we what we wanted to do first is is is, is really sort of test the ideas as they as they were developing uh, in the field. So, um, recognizing, of course. Uh, as someone who works on disaster risk, that talking about disasters as a point in time is is, is contentious in itself. Recognizing that, yeah. At the same time, for if you're going to do some kind of change, you need to set time points in order to analyze them. So we have to, even if they're notional, we have to conceive of times of points along the disaster process, from its antecedents to its long-term recovery. So we've kind of set up this 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 way of noting it really. So the disaster event is time zero. We want to know what things were like at a, set, at a point in time before then. Um, and we can fix that at some, at maybe, you know, notionally it can be two months, six weeks, three months, whatever makes sense in that particular context. What things were like before the onset of the, of the hazard event that led to the disaster. T plus one is in the, is in the, the, very, the immediate term so the short term afterwards, when one would expect the impacts of the disaster to be at their highest, but also at the sort of point when initiation of intervention is likely to take place. And then T plus two is a point in time further down the line, the point at which we want to undertake the evaluation to establish change. <coughs> um, now, um, Marcella, I think you, you referred to, did you refer to the re retrospective? You didn't, okay. So <clears throat> one of the things that we've decided to do uh, to, to was that the focus in this guide would be, to, would be to do a retrospective analysis. So in essence, what we're suggesting is that in most situations, the most practical way to do this is to actually do the work at T plus two, not to attempt data, data gathering at T plus one for various reasons that I'm going to ask Vivian to explain if, later if we need to. Um, but we do it at T, pl at, at T plus two. And the attempt then is to retrospectively understand change in people's lives and livelihoods of key indicators. From T minus one to T plus one, in other words, then the impact, the immediate impact of the, of the disaster. From T plus one to T plus two, uh, the pattern of 
of of uh, the base of the processes of intervention and the uh, and the responses that people have made, and then from T minus one to T plus two, which is what we're really interested in, which is the the change over time. And once we're and so that's what we're looking at that change, and we're trying to then establish contribution to that. Um, it is there is an alternative which we suggest, uh, which is if there are resources available, uh, to and, and if it, it, the context allows it for there to be a, a data collection at T plus one. The, the issue of, um, of recall is something that we were quite, you know, we took quite, that was one of the reasons that we, that we did this type of, uh, of, of um, testing of the field methods, was that we wanted to establish the extent to which we could get reliable recall, recall on a number of indicators. And uh, our finding was that it was reasonably robust for a period of, of about six to 12 months. Beyond that, we would have reservations about undertaking this type of analysis. Again, we can clarify any of these points more in, in questions. <coughs> Excuse me. So those things I've talked about going to sort of part one of the guide, which is talking about the approach. Parts two and three deal with the data collection and analysis. Um, and we organize it into a whole series of steps. And each of these steps has some indications of, of some of the key Substeps in order to achieve that step. Um, uh, simple in ex explanation, hopefully written in simple enough language um, that it's accessible to a range of audiences, not just English, e people with English as a first language. I'm not going to go through all the data collection stuff, most of which is fairly standard. I think most, if not all, uh, to, to, to many type, types of data collection in evaluation as well as research. Um, and I'm also not going to go through the preliminary analysis parts, but I just want to focus a little bit on the last part, which is arguably the most difficult. Um, and it's important to, to focus on this for another reason, in that though we, we set out to make this uh, something that could be done by non-specialists, we have some reservations about that. Um, it's such a complex thing to do to establish change that we think... Um, a kind of a medium level of expertise is required, particularly in terms of the ana analytical skills. And this is often where, um, including in research, this is often where you know you come up against a, a barrier of capacity. People less prepared to to sort of stick their neck out into and do an analysis that, in essence, has to be interpretive. There has to be an interpretation of change and contribution from the evidence available. Okay, so it requires a process of, of analysis. Um, <coughs> But what, what we recommend is following the data collection process of both quantitative and qualitative methods are brought together in a kind of a narrative account. We, we feel that the, the, the simplest and most effective way to do this is to break it down, even though we're interested multi-sectorally, is to break this analysis down into particular sectors of interest, which could be, um, it could be um, economic livelihood support, um, it could be WASH, um, education, whatever, whatever the, the, the key sectors, um, the key relating to the key sectors of impact, but also the, particularly the key sectors of I intervention in this context. Work through it by sector, sector by sector. What were the main impacts? What was the type of, characterise the recovery process <coughs> and characterise the nature of intervention. I say no, the recovery. Sorry, characterise the response process that, that, that of which there's evidence within the community. But it's also key in this part to to raise and discuss these these other more cross-cutting factors, which which may be to do with governance, they may be to do um, with other types of changes, including other disasters and hazard contexts, but also you know economic change and so on. All of which, of course, will have a great great deal of effect on the nature of recovery. So all this needs, needs to be taken account of. We then recommend that conclusions are drawn again on a sectoral basis that try to then go sort of beyond this and say, okay, what appears to be the level of recovery based on this evidence that we have and to what extent does the evidence suggest that there's been a, 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 con a significant or not contribution um, by the, from, the, from the effects of intervention? And then to generate, as a kind of a shorthand 
way of representing this, a set of what we call in contribution statements. And, I, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to indicate what I mean by those. <coughs> but it has to go beyond that, and it has to, to then bring together the, the statements around particular sectors to, to talk about recovery in, in, more, in, in general, to generate conclusions about recovery in general. <coughs> so these contribution to change statements are, as I say, it's a kind of a, a shorthand tool way of, of conveying what is, what also has to be accompanied by a fairly, <coughs> a fairly sort of complicated explanation of the situation. Um, <coughs> and there's three statements. One is the level of recovery achieved in relation to what's required. So thinking back to those circles I showed, those ovals I showed before. The contribution of the intervention to the recovery that's been achieved. And the combination of those then reveals contribution to change. And in this, what we're suggesting is there can be a simple categorization for each of these from high to low. Um, and in the guide, we give various tables and diagrams to kind of to, to help guide the person through this process of making a decision and assigning a category. Now, these are... I was quite pleased with myself because I've discovered how to do screenshots because otherwise I, these were constructed in Word and, and, and would be a mess to sort of like attempt to copy into PowerPoint. However, it does mean it's a little bit blurry. So these are not exactly the same as the ones in the book because they've got colour. Um, and you, know, it's, you can't necessarily read them. But the idea is to get the principle, which is basically uh, you, you, a number of questions are, are asked which are in the tables in the book and you assign a category to the level of recovery achieved, effectively from high to low. The same for contribution to recovery achieved. Okay. And then it gets to where it gets slightly complicated and impossible to read. Uh, <coughs> it is possible to read in the book, of course. Uh, we then mix these two, these two together. So what you've got on the left-hand side is the A and the B, and then the C, which is the contribution to change, um, brings these together, okay, and you pair up findings on in A and B, and that will and, and trace the lines, and that will take you to one of the categories under C. C has has more has five categories in order to capture a bit more um, uh, finer distinction between them. And um, if I can give I give some examples of about why that's important. Um, the other thing to note is not it's not just a simply a matter of pairing up. Basically, if the contribution to re if the let me get this right, the yes, if the contribution of interventions to recovery achieved, if it's if it's assigned low, then the contribution to change can only be low, as you can see. So the, the sort of I think they're dark blue arrows. If the contribution is no matter how much recovery has actually been achieved, the contribution, which is what we're interested in, is going to be low. So that implies that, that actually it's the communities themselves that have achieved most of most of what's been gained. Um, but if you, if you look at the other, look at the top half, and the low category for, um, for the level of recovery achieved, now let me, let me get this right, um, what we've done there is, is so as to capture, so if, if your level of recovery overall in the community we say is low, but there has been a demonstrable impact of intervention towards the, the, that, despite it, though it's low, there has been something that's demonstrable uh, in impact, then, that, then that's then revealed by tracing it through. You probably get a medium low or a medium in terms of contribution to change. So it's acknowledging that some change has been, has been contributed to, but tempering that by recognition that there's still an enormous way to go. Now, that's how we've done it. Okay. Um, but I have to, I have to emphasise that conclusions ha they really have to go beyond this. It, it, it's, it's, it's something that's different about this, about this guide, but it's by no means the, the be all and end all. The, the, the methodology that we suggest involves collecting a, a, a lot of data, a lot of quite rich data, um, about all sorts of things that perhaps, perhaps are, aren't always captured in, in all evaluations. And so it's key that this is, these simple statements have have some very um, so have some important discussions that, to explain the context and explain some of the sort of caveats and so on. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I've, 
what we I mean, one of the things that, things that we actually discuss in the general conclusions is that they should go. So you have you have your contribution to change statements, and then the more general conclusion to talk about overall patterns of recovery, the relative importance in this of people's own actions and community-based activities. Discusses the main reasons why change has or has not been achieved, and bearing in mind that there's a large element of this is, is qualitative, and that's that's where a lot of these kinds of evidence for these kind of statements comes. So a lot, of, a lot of what we're recommending to do is qualitative. Raises any additional economic, social, cultural, political, or environmental factors that have strongly shaped the effectiveness of the interventions. And there's a few more, but I'll mainly mention one more. Identifies any negative consequences or unintended impacts of interventions. And in effect, we can think of these as contributions to negative change as opposed to contributions to positive change. So the attempt is to try and put interventions into, into, the, into this wider context. Um, now, we're not suggesting in any sense that this approach can take the place of other forms of evaluation, clearly more process-based, more performance-based evaluations, evaluations looking at operations, at, 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 um, uh, at pro program outputs and so on. They still have to be undertaken, um, and, they, and this cannot in any way replace those. Um, so we, it's something that, um, it's a, t a method of evaluation that we suggest is, takes, a place, takes place alongside those other forms of evaluation. And just to finish, um, one of the things we feel is that although the evaluation it's methodology itself is designed for a very specific context, <coughs> excuse me, um, the way it's the way that we're suggesting it's done, we very much hope would lead would lead to sort of wider learning outcomes around the particular effectiveness of interventions and also of the of the sorts of issues that can undermine the effectiveness of intervention in this particular context of, of post disasters. I think that's my last slide. Yes, it is. <laughs>